Welcome to The Supernatural with Laura Maxwell on Eternal Radio. In these programs, we will hear the true supernatural accounts from those who try various spiritualities. You shall tell the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm delighted to welcome back to the show Willie Needham of Set the Captives Free Ministries. And the last time Willie was on, um, my husband actually laughed at me because I was so excited. We'd never dedicated the show to the topic of evangelism before. So when I said the word evangelism, my voice went really high pitched and it was quite funny. Um, so, so let's welcome Willie back to the show. Hi, Willie. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, so excited to be here as I was last time. <laughs> In fact, my my voice gets a little bit high pitched whenever I start thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Well, that's the two of us then. Um, so today, actually, you're going to share. I had asked you before if you could share with us um, your experience with meeting people. Who, who are not Christian, um, particularly people who are perhaps into the New Age or the esoteric, the supernatural cults and so on. And you said, yes, you'd had experience of meeting these folks. So this is going to be a really good show. Um, I, I suppose I would start off by asking you, how would you personally define a cult group? Well, the basic definition of it is uh, any kind of man-made religion that isn't uh, authentic Christianity. Uh, And that could be anything from an outright separate religion like Islam. Um, or it could be, you know, or Hinduism or Buddhism. You know, those are completely separate religions, uh, but still man-made. But then you also have uh, counterfeit Christian groups where they they exist under the guise of Christianity they they claim to you know follow Jesus they claim to believe in the bible but yet they are completely counterfeit and some examples of that would be uh, like the mormons or the jehovah's witnesses and um and really like the new age the new age movement i mean that's that's something that kind of it, it it's just a category of groups where uh, there are some groups that just exist independently, uh, whereas a lot of others, as you know, uh, are infiltrating the authentic Christian church in order to uh, pervert the truth. So there, there's you know it's it's kind of a I know it's kind of a broad definition, but that's about as narrow as I can make it. Sure, sure. Um. And how would you personally identify, um, you know, some counterfeit Christianity groups in general? Well, the best way to identify a counterfeit is to have a thorough knowledge and understanding of of the genuine, of the authentic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so like, you know, we understand that in true Christianity, God is one in three persons, the Trinity, you know, that Jesus Christ is the Christ, you know, he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, and that the Bible is the sole source of of um, uh, information where we get, you know, get that from, you know, that the Bible is the Word of God, um, you know. So, like, to understand authentic Christianity is the, the biggest step into being able to identify counterfeit so if you hear somebody talking about things in a way that doesn't that doesn't line up with scripture mm-hmm. uh, or you know true Christian doctrine, then you can you can tell initially that there's something not right about it. Um, what I personally do whenever I'm evangelizing is I do what's called the three minutes to live street test, mm-hmm. and um, what that does is it puts it puts their basic teachings. To the ultimate test, um, and uh, you know you're familiar with the the story in in the book of Luke about the thief on the cross, right? Mm-hmm. You know where, you know 
you know, Lord, remember me in, you know, in, when you, in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, you know, this day we'll be together in paradise. Um, you know, obviously that, that thief only had a couple of minutes to live. I mean, he was nailed to a cross. He was condemned to die. So there was nothing that he could have done on his own merit to be saved. But nevertheless, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith and you know, the captain of our salvation, was able to declare to this man, you will be with me in paradise. Um, so using that scriptural principle, I, I will pose the question to this person, um, okay, let's, let's hypothetically say I have three minutes to live. You know, there's there's a like let's say there's a knife in my back and I'm I you know there's no way that an ambulance can get to me. I'm going to die in, in a, just a couple of minutes. What must I do to get into heaven? Now, a Christian will be able to tell you that you know turn from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ as your only source of salvation. You know, like that's that's sufficient mm-hmm. with Christianity, but. What happens when you find a counterfeit is that they will start telling you things that you know are not true. Like, oh well, um, uh, I guess you know I can't I can't get you baptized this quickly. Um, you know, you only have a few minutes. Uh, you know, you, you would normally have to do a you know start a Bible study or you have to do this, you have to do that. You just don't have time. You know, or they might say oh, you have nothing to worry about because everything leads to God, you know, or the worst that can happen is you'll cease to exist. Obviously, if they say things like that, then you can be sure that they're a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. And you can find out very quickly. (laughs) Yeah, it seems so when when you've got those kind of questions to ask them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... Can you give some examples of of some of these groups um, that that you have met? I mean, obviously it, it's it's awkward because we feel as if we're labelling people into groups, but it does it does genuinely help um, when we're talking to people. Yeah, there. Um, based on my location, I, I'm uh, I do a lot of my ministry in the state of New York, um, where I'm approximately two hours away from the world headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. Um, so for me, I get, I, I deal a lot with, with them where, you know, not only are they, you know, knocking on my door, uh, attempting to, you know, sell their Watchtower magazine subscriptions, but they also are on the street corner, mm-hmm. you know, attempting to distribute literature. So I, I, I encounter them the most frequently uh, but I have also dealt with uh, Mormons, mm-hmm. um, and the most unusual group that I've dealt with uh, that you know I, w- I never expected at first was actually the Seventh Day Adventists, mm-hmm. where um, you know I had kind of a Sherlock Holmes experience uh, discovering the uh, the heresy within their within their church their organization, mm-hmm. where you know they were there were some missionaries. Who, interestingly enough, were knocking on my door. So I thought they were Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> but um, they. But surprisingly, they never told me who they were with. Mm. They refused to give any indication as to what organization they were a part of. Mm. Um, but they would they would drop subtle hints, and I even did the uh, the three minute to live street test on them, mm-hmm. and they gave me a very. It was a very bizarre response where they they told me oh your your soul is going to be put to sleep until the final judgment uh you know and, and if you're if you're good enough to go to heaven then you'll go to heaven and if you're not good enough you'll you'll see you'll be you know thrown into a lake of fire where you'll cease to exist mm. Mm, well that's a little odd yeah. so upon further investigation um, you know, over the next couple of weeks uh, they were you know they had they had spoken of their their veganism uh, which is, you know, I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with veganism in itself, mm-hmm. um, but it was a it was a legalistic practice where if you ate meat, it was a sin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they they spoke a lot about keeping the Sabbath. Obviously, like, there is the command, but it was it was in a legalistic manner mm-hmm. upon which, you know, where if you're not observing the Sabbath on Saturday, you are not saved. You know, so there's there was a lot to it. You know, so a lot of these things were, were getting more and more bizarre until one day I, 
I was actually uh, I was interviewing one of these missionaries. I'd been go- having a good dialogue with these guys for a couple weeks by this point, and one of the questions that the Lord put on my heart to ask this guy was, "What would have happened to you before you had come back to the church? If had you died before coming back to the church?" Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Lord just kind of put that on my heart because I was I was interviewing him, but I that wasn't on my list of questions to ask. Yeah. So it was just kind of spontaneous. So I know it was of the Lord because he looked at me like he even like, you know, uh, like sat upright, you know, puffed out his chest and said very proudly, well, I wouldn't be burning in hell if that's what you're getting at. You know, and it, because I had asked him like, what would, what would you have done if you had died outside of where you are now? Mm-hmm. You know, and as, you know, as you and I both know that if you die without Christ, you know, if you die without you know, being saved through the blood of Jesus, you know, you will end up in an eternal punishment of hell. Mm-hmm. And he very proudly said that that wouldn't have happened to him. Mm. Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes that if you are deemed wicked, um, you know, not worthy of, of the kingdom of heaven, that you are, that you simply cease to exist on the last day. Mm. Uh, you know, and that's that's the the teaching known as annihilationism, okay. and um, and yet that so, would that's almost like well, you know, why did Jesus bother coming here and and living and dying on the cross for our sins if if we just became annihilated? Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, if you if you th- I mean, you know, if you think that all that's going to happen is you cease to exist, then you really are devaluing. Uh, the work of Christ mm-hmm. on the cross, you know, that, that is certainly for sure. And, and you also have little to no understanding of the severity of your sin if that's all you believe is going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I was able to, I was able to have a, a discussion further. It was, it was a very heated discussion, but um, in the end, I was able to make him think about it because I posed to him, uh, What's recount? What's um, what Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter sixteen, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man was in torment. You know, he was completely aware of what was going on. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in in his torment, he was able to have a conversation with Abraham. You know, and, and up in in uh, in paradise. So, you know, whenever I posed that to him, because he was, you know, he was convinced, like, oh, you just cease to exist because of this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. But when I posed that 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 scripture to him, he's like, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to have to study this. I'm going to have to look into this a little further. Mm-hmm. So praise God that, you know, I was able to you know make him think about it for a moment. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I was never able to speak with him any further. But, you know, let's, let's definitely, you know, I've been praying for that guy regularly. Who knows? Maybe he's saved now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, you know, I, I, I did a, a full message on that whole experience um and it's on it's on my podcast it's called the sabbath deception mm-hmm. so there's there's a lot of it's like an hour long message uh debunking the seventh day adventist church mm-hmm. um a lot of a lot of explanation behind it um now as far as the new agers uh there, <laughs> i've had a an equally interesting experience that was a whole lot shorter uh where i was i was preaching one day I was I was doing the soapbox style. I was on the street corner, and um, interestingly enough, those Seven Day Adventist missionaries were in my crowd, um, which I just made for a very very bizarre day. Mm-hmm. And um, but I, yeah, I had a good sized crowd that day, and there was this lady, an older lady who was from Russia, where she just happened to be walking by. She was hearing me speak the word of God, and and she started uh, she started uh, giving me a hard time. Because she was convinced that everybody is God within, mm-hmm. you know, very pantheistic, um, like oh, you know, God exists inside of you. God, you know, like you are, you are a manifestation of God. I'm a manifestation of God. The the box you're standing on is a manifestation of God. Mm-hmm. You know, just everything is God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, it was it was something I wasn't prepared to properly debate. You know, in a formal setting. Mm-hmm. But what I what I did was, you know, I just I introduced myself. Um, there's actually a video of this online, of how I how I handled it. 
yeah. because she was very hostile at first. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she she hated the fact that I was speaking with the authority of Scripture. I mean, calling you know, saying, "Oh, you're you're still living in you know a 17th century," you mm-hmm. know. Um, but after a while, because I, I started um, giving her the Ten Commandments, you're just sharing with her the law of God, because as it says in in uh, Galatians, the law is the tutor that brings us to Christ. You know, so it, it, what it was doing, it was, it was working conviction in her heart because she, at the beginning of the conversation, she was saying everybody's God within, Mm -hmm. which is a very common, um, thing, you know, a common belief within the new age movement. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like you're your own God, but within a matter of 15 minutes or so, she started saying, Oh, but I'm only human. Yeah. So, uh, you know, praise God that, you know, there was, there was some truth being spoken to her. Mm-hmm. You know, she was kind of awakened for, you know, at least that moment that, wait a minute, I guess I'm not God within. I am only human, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hopefully I was able to leave her with some truth. But, yeah, that's very common with, with the New Age uh, experience, like, you know, the New Age people I've, I've uh, experienced dealing with where they all just kind of believe in themselves being God. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because there is that, you know, that contradiction. If if we were all God, then um, we would be acting a whole lot more perfectly, you know, than we do. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so, so I think that when you, when you start to go through the Ten Commandments with people, then they realise, and it does, Scripture is powerful, but, you know, it also just makes them think um, of the contradictions in, in that other... Um, type of teaching and um, has, has there been any other groups that you've met specifically or, or, or any even that were even perhaps a little more unusual um, actually uh, yeah one one immediately comes to mind that's that's unusual um, it, it's um, it's the, the five percenters and um, <laughs> you know, based on based on the title, you can you can probably imagine it's a very small group, um, but they're they're actually a part of the nation of Islam, which which like Islam itself regards as like 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 uh, a cult within Islam. Okay. You know, like they don't they don't consider it to be true Islam because uh, the nation of Islam is like very much a political movement, but there's a lot of like. Like New Age spiritual stuff, where the five percenters believe that that only five percent of the world population is enlightened, mm-hmm. and that the other ninety five percent are just a bunch of devils who, you know, are just they just exist to make the five percent look better, mm-hmm. and they have like their own their own like code language uh, where they they speak in circles to to sound intelligent and to confuse their uh their opponents Mm -hmm. and they're very violent Mm -hmm. um you know so if you ever like if you ever hear somebody speaking of the five percenters like if they're a part of that i would i would recommend that you you uh not engage in any further dialogue just for safety reasons because you know if you're if they if they don't believe that you're a part of the five percent you know of the five percenters they believe you're a devil and they will they will be very violent toward you. Um, I was very fortunate because like the group that I was with outnumbered this person, mm-hmm. but still uh, he started out kind of relaxed, kind of laid back. But as we were speaking to him the word of God, he became very agitated and was cursing us and getting very loud and very hostile. And it was it was it was definitely a very dangerous situation. And he was, you know, because you know he said he was part of the five percenters, and um, but yeah, definitely a very unusual mm. situation where I just kind of had to, for the, for safety reasons, I had to kind of cut the conversation short. And um, you know, I had you know for the for the interest of safety of the rest of my group, you know, I said, all right, guys, like we really we really need to get going. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it was it was scary because. Um, because as we were we were packing up and leaving, uh, there was a young lady in our group, who you know very sweet, very very kind, very genuine. You know, like she really cares about the lost so much that you know she she just wants everybody to know Jesus, and that's wonderful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But 
you know, I was, I had to, you know, I was looking out for her safety, but he was like calling, singling her out. Oh, uh-huh. You know, he's like, Hey, you, you know, you young lady, come over here. Mm. You know? Mm-hmm. And I said, I, <laughs> I told her, you know, don't you, don't you dare, <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. like there is, there is a, there is something really going on here that is, that is beyond, beyond what we're trained to handle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so unfortunately I had to walk away from it, but you know, we were able to, to share the word of God with him. We were able to, to pray for him on a, on a different note. And um, it was definitely a learning experience. I mean, the five percenters probably don't exist outside of America. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're like – they're very, very big in like like metropolitan areas like New York City and Chicago and um, you know those, those kind of places where it's very big. So it's actually unusual where we were. To find a five percenter, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I think as well, you know, when these things happen, it, it's interesting because when we look back on it later, we think, well, that was that was an unusual situation, that was a bit bizarre or whatever. But um, I'm sure he's met other Christians, and and we just don't know, you know, the, the folks can can find Jesus later on, and and the little that we did say to them um, can be a seed that that the Holy Spirit can water and. Um, just because we don't see results then and there, and for all we know, that guy is walking with Jesus now. So, um, and it's an experience, it's a learning curve, isn't it? I'm so glad that mm-hmm. that lady had you, and I think that's why it's important that we do work in teams as well, isn't it? Because we're there for each other, we're there, mm-hmm. we're a, we're accountable to each other. You were her leader, so in that instance, although she maybe really wanted to go and talk to the guy a bit further, um, she took your leading, and I think that's um. I think that's why it's always good to at least go in twos, if not um, a team. Mhm. Absolutely. I I always I always will tell people you know just you know <laughs> you know do do your best to go out with at least one other person mm-hmm. you know for safety. I mean it it even says in the you know in Ecclesiastes you know the cord of three strands is not quickly broken because you know if there's at least somebody else if anything happens there's somebody else who can help you. Um, but I also tell people, you know, that if you really have that strong of con- of a conviction to go out and share the gospel, and nobody else is able to help you at the moment, go. Yeah. Make sure somebody at least knows where you are, mm-hmm. at the very least. You know, but you know, just go. You know, like <laughs> don't don't disobey the Holy Spirit just because you know nobody else can help you at the moment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with that as well. Absolutely, and. You know, talking about different groups and different cult groups and so on, what would you say is the the biggest attraction for people? What what would you say it is that leads people into um, these various groups? I would definitely say, you know, through uh, you know just a lot of a lot of my personal experience and and hearing about people who are who have been caught into groups like that uh, is definitely like. I don't want to call it selfish ambition, but there's like it's definitely it's like a self-centeredness, um, and I, I I don't want to mean that in like a negative way necessarily for all of it, uh, because sometimes people just have needs, mm-hmm. you know, like they're lonely, you know, like shut-ins, you know, so they're the elderly, they don't have any other family, you know, and these people are coming knocking on their door and you know cutting their grass. You know they're they're ministering to their deficiencies, and it really it really draws them in. Um, you know, but there's also the the same kind of sin that that drew Adam and Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. You know, they have a desire for you know for self improvement. You know, they have that they have that that drive to um, make themselves better than other people, or make themselves better than they used to be. Mm-hmm. Where you know a lot of the new age movements, you know they they kind of you know like I said before, they revolve around oh you are God within, you know so there's there's a lot of that that individualistic sort of thing to where you know even you know a lot of a lot of new age will just allow you to pick and choose which religions you like. Or you know, just kind of like lay out all the you know all the aspects of every religion in the world on a like a buffet line, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Like, oh well, I you know I like I like the nice Jesus, so I'm going to put that on in in my my beliefs. But I don't really like the I don't really like the temple turning you know Jesus, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave him out. Uh, oh, I like the whole 
you know, all paths lead to God of, of, of Hinduism. Okay, I'm going to put that, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a like a desire to have what you want, to have things your way. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, those are those are definitely the the biggest attractions for these cult groups. Mm-hmm. I, I suppose I can relate to that. I'm thinking about myself before I knew Jesus. Um, yeah, there was that very much. What can I get out of this? What can this particular teaching do for me? You know, whether it's health, self-help groups or whatever. On the one hand, I, I was thinking and hoping that I was trying to make myself a better person. I was trying to, you know, advance my spirituality. I was trying to improve my soul, as it were. So on the one hand, you were you were trying to be a better human being. But on the other hand, it was, what is it going to do for me? What can I get out of it? Um, and I think as well... Because a lot of these things do have some elements of, of truth in them, that that does attract a people too. Because people, I think, instinctively know when there's some truth there, so they will, um, you know, be drawn to it. Of course, it's not the whole truth, um, and it's not the truth of the gospel, so it is actually a deception. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it, it might sound like we're being cheeky, saying it's a self, in a sense, a selfish. Um, endeavor to to be attracted to spiritualities but even the most altruistic person on the earth has still got some selfishness in them we're just human so mm-hmm. yeah we do whereas when we come to jesus he he can fulfill um you know the different needs that, that we have yes but also um it's about denying ourself uh, mm-hmm. deny ourselves and follow him then we really will become a you know our soul will grow if you like so he really is the answer to, to I think all the, the, the questions that people get attracted to these groups for mm-hmm. and so what what should you do you know if someone's listening um, how would you advise them if, if someone is perhaps um, they've perhaps met someone in, in such a group maybe in the workplace maybe a friend or relative how would you advise them um, what to do in that situation? Well, depending on where you are, whenever whenever you you discover this, um, you know you might have the ability to have a conversation right there. Uh, but a lot of times, it's really best to set up a separate time and place to meet because uh-huh. uh, this way. Neither side has to be defensive. Sure. Um, you know, I've I've been I've been in many situations uh, evangelizing, and I I will encounter a cult group, and you know, the first time I've ever encountered one, I was very I was very confrontational, and and they were very defensive. So really, when I walked away from it, you know, I didn't really feel very victorious or anything like that. And I know they didn't. Mm -hmm. I know they probably were very flustered afterward. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, every time I encounter somebody who's from any, you know, any kind of cult group, I'll have a discussion with them, you know, just very briefly um, when I'm out evangelizing, but I won't focus on it too much. I'll usually just exchange contact information and make every effort to meet at a different time in a different place mm-hmm. um, because that way it gives them a chance to get, to be prepared um, and gives you a chance to be prepared. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and, I mean, cause what I, what I usually will offer is like, Hey, you know, let's, let's go to, you know, such and such ice cream place, you know, we'll get an ice cream cone, mm-hmm. my treat, you know, and you know, that way the, there's, there's some hospitality, there's some, you know, you know, just, you know, some kindness being shown toward them, you know, so that way, both sides can can sit down and we can treat each other you know like like human beings mm-hmm. because they are people you know if you if you prick them they will bleed they have feelings mm-hmm. they have dreams they have they have desires they have fears and so you know to to treat them as such you know because they were also created by god even though they are an enemy of god at the moment they're still a creation. God still loves them, so we need to show them just as much love, mm-hmm. you know. So don't don't be you know calling them cult devils, you know. Don't insult their character, mm-hmm. 
you know, don't be, you know, don't be insulting the founder of their organization, um, you know, regardless of whatever character flaws their founder may have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, don't be, you know, don't be, don't be doing that. You know, it, <laughs> the goal is not to make them cry. The goal is to bring them to Jesus. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I suppose it is tempting to, to, to start to call out the flaws uh, with their founder or what have you. But, you know, naturally speaking, it, that is going to make a person feel defensive they're going to shut down, you know, they're not going to be quite as open to hear the things that, that they need to hear um, mm-hmm. that, that, that will help them. You know, I remember um, when I was still a new ager, a, a couple of Mormons came to my door, you know, trying to uh, share their message. And in actual fact, I would have listened to them because I just like to listen to anyone's spiritual beliefs. I was interested in everything. So... But when I told the guy I was a spiritualist, um, you know, he one of the guys shouted at me, you're following Satan, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, and he was really quite, I, I got such a shock and I was so hurt that I just had to say, you know, thanks, I don't want to talk anymore. And I closed the door. Now, in actual fact, the guy was, was, was true. It was right. You know, I was following Satan, but I didn't know that then. And it just shocked me and made me want to turn away um you know and i think as well what you're saying is really really great advice because if if you meet someone later and take them to a cafe or or they choose a cafe i think then you're both kind of feeling on neutral ground and it's a neutral area sorry so it will feel like equal ground and, and neither party will feel threatened in any way and it's just a better environment to open up and as you say they might have I went my way home and they've thought of further questions to ask you and all that. So it sounds like a terrific idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I do think it's, you know, kind of, you know, it's interesting that you had a Mormon tell you that, you know, that you were following Satan. It's kind of a, you know, kind of the pot calling the kettle black sort of situation, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, um, because, you know, even though these people are, you know, like they're, they're, decent people, mm-hmm. you know, like particular, specifically referring to the Mormons, um, you know, nevertheless, they are still following a false gospel mm-hmm. and, you know, anything that is not the true gospel is of Satan, mm-hmm. you know, so it, it is a little ironic that you were told that in such a way. Um, but there are, there are four different approaches that I've, I've discovered over the years um, on like specifically how to deal with, with cult members. Uh, first of all is what I call the shock and awe approach. Oh. Now, <laughs> now it's one of those, like you have to use it ve- with, with a great deal of caution, mm-hmm. you know, as, as you know, you can imagine, um, the example that, that I've, that I have for this is if you're talking to a Mormon, uh, pose the question to them, what if I told you that you were going to outer darkness? Mm-hmm. Because for a Mormon, like that is the worst sort of punishment that that anybody can can uh, can experience. I mean, that's their equivalent to hell. Mm-hmm. And and Mormons certainly don't believe that they're going to outer darkness. Uh, they don't even believe that non Mormons are going to go to outer darkness. Like they they believe that outer darkness is reserved for Lucifer. So if you if you just kind of ask that question, you know, and you pose it. You know, gently, it's going to just, you know, it's going to, you know, <laughs> it, it basically is going to do what I'm doing right now. They're going to be like, what? <laughs> um, it's going to get their attention. And that's all it should ever be used for mm-hmm. because nobody's ever told them that before. Mm-hmm. Nobody's, you know, Mormons have never heard anybody tell them that. So they're going to be like, okay, let's see what this guy has to say. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it can, it can get, it can get their attention but that's all you should ever use it for, you know. And if you don't get their attention, well, then you kind of messed up, you know. So that's why I, I urge caution on that, on that approach. Mm-hmm. Um, the second approach is the scriptural approach, and you know that is that's where you methodically will go through scripture and and put it side by side with their teaching, because a lot of these cult groups they will either. Um, have their own translation of the Bible. Uh, for instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have 
the New World translation, which is a complete and total mistranslation of the of the scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas the Mormons, they have the Bible plus four other sources that they they put equal to the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, they have like the Pearl of Great Price or uh, anything that the president of the LDS Church says is like equal to Scripture. Yeah. So when you you know if you take the scriptural approach, you're taking scripture itself, you know, in its in its purest form and putting it side by side with their teachings and showing them how there is a contradiction between between what they're saying and what the truth actually is, and um, you know that that works for people who have a very methodical mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like uh, you know I have a, I, I know people who who do a very very good job with this, and they're like they're like union contract negotiators who are very you know they they just follow a very very carefully choreographed uh approach Mm -hmm. so if you want to do it that way you know i would i would suggest that you plan ahead and have a very very thorough knowledge of scripture Mm -hmm. uh you know once again being able to identify a counterfeit by understanding the authentic Mm -hmm. um there's the the third approach is the devotional approach where you know you take them in as a friend you know you you know you show them a great deal of kindness you share your testimony with them you know you you show them and don't just tell them about what Jesus has done in your lives show them what Jesus has done in in your life mm-hmm. and show them what Jesus can do in their life you know that's that's what you know that's what i call the devotional approach mm-hmm. where you know you're just kind of a life on life friendship sort of thing and that's something that anybody who has a testimony can do mm-hmm. um now my personal favorite approach it's the fourth one is known is called the historical approach mm-hmm. um and it's probably the easiest uh, if you have basic understanding of how some of the the larger cult groups were founded, such as you know the Mormon Church being founded by Joseph Smith, or the Jehovah's Witnesses being founded by Charles Russell, yeah. Seventh Day Adventist Church being by Ellen White. If you have any understanding of how these these groups were founded, um, those three groups actually have one major thing in common. Uh, and it's actually f- uh, failed prophetic predictions. Oh. Um, I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses are obviously the most famous for that, mm-hmm. um, you know, by claiming that Jesus was going to physically return in 1914. Mm-hmm. And then in 1915, they said, oh, we never said that. We said that he was going to return invisibly and only to uh, the leadership of the Watchtower. You know, so that's that's a failed prophetic prediction. Yeah. Um, and what for the for the Mormons, interestingly enough, not a lot of people know about this. But Joseph Smith, you know, who was uh, regarded as a prophet in the Mormon Church, had made a prediction that there would be a Mormon temple built in Independence, Missouri, before the end of their generation. You know, so meaning. When Joseph Smith and everybody else who helped found the church died, like that was it. And sure enough, like that whole generation passed away, and even to this day, there is no such temple. It never got built. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he claimed to have made a, a prophetic prediction, you know, based on like what God told him, you know, like so what he claimed God told him, and it never happened. Yeah. And then for the Seventh day Adventists, once again, not a lot of people really know about it, but I, I discovered this upon uh, reading one of their books. Uh, it's called The Great Controversy. And um, there was a man named William Miller back in uh, the early 1800s who had predicted that um, that Jesus was going to return in spring of 1843. Mm-hmm. You know, based on some mathematic calculations that he tried to make. Um, so... Spring came, spring went, Jesus didn't come back. And then he said, oh, uh, I made a miscalculation. It's actually going to be the fall of 1843. Well, fall came, fall went. Oh, um, yeah, actually the fall of – or the the spring of 1844, Mm -hmm. you know, and then he did that for the fall of 1844. And so that whole uh, time frame in the Seventh-day Adventist church is actually known as the Great Disappointment. Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, it is actually it's not it's not hidden it's mm-hmm. actually celebrated yeah. within the Seventh Day Adventist Church. 
um, which I, honestly I think is a little a little bizarre, but you know, okay. <laughs> um, and so, keeping those three groups in mind, uh, because they're the biggest ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look in in Deuteronomy chapter eighteen, verses twenty through twenty two. It says, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Now, that's those are some pretty strong words. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so this is part of the historical approach. So if you if you have an understanding of, of a you know, like if you know that the group is responsible for making failed predictions, you bring that up to them mm-hmm. and you bring that scripture, uh it will it will definitely make them think. Yeah. Um in fact really like if you if you ha- ever have to deal with Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on your door on a regular basis, because in, in my my area it happens every week. Uh, even if you tell them, please don't come back. If you actually bring up that scripture and you bring up the fact that their organization has done that, they'll, they will end the conversation right away and they will never come back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like it, it's, it definitely like they will head for the hills mm-hmm. very quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, our goal is not to make them go away. Our goal is to, to make them really think about it. But the fact is, is that these groups also have one thing in common that because they're man made they're man um, or like they're man merit it you know meaning like you have to earn your own salvation mm-hmm. so if if they're confronted with the fact that that you know their their leaders are responsible for failing mm-hmm. um, you know it really it really it makes them think very hard and it it, it will even you know kind of freak them out a little bit mm-hmm. and um you know, hopefully, hopefully it's enough to make them want to leave, to leave that cult, you know, and uh, and hopefully, better yet, um, come to repentance and salvation in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting that you know those four different approaches that you mentioned because I think sometimes um, when when Christians are are doing evangelism, you know, they'll maybe just assume. Well, all I have to do is quote a scripture, and because scripture is truth, they'll definitely receive it and get saved. Or all I have to do is, you know, blah blah blah. But but no, because each person is unique, anyway. And certainly, for if they're part of a certain group, there will be certain things that will work and certain things that won't. Um, and everybody's unique and, and different approaches um c- c- can touch them when others perhaps won't. Um, so, see the, these um, approaches. Do you have these listed on your blog? I'm actually in the process of um, of getting it all organized. Um, what I do have is I, I made like a little like a like a miniature ebook for Jehovah's Witnesses specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like 11 pages, uh, and it's something that you can download. Um, uh, from my website, uh, all you got to do is uh, subscribe to the mailing list, and it's you know just like a little eleven pages, uh, and it's specifically for Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, it's just the first of hopefully many little ebooks that I'm I'm planning to make for that particular purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, so like I want to make one for dealing with New Agers, I want to make one dealing with atheists, with Mormons. Um, you know, so on and so forth, mm-hmm. uh, to equip people yeah. because it can be very intimidating dealing with somebody who is a part of a cult because these cults, um, you know, they they tend to be very aggressive in their, um, you know, getting their message out there. I don't want to call it evangelism because mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. evangelism is for the gospel, mm-hmm. you know, but. I guess proselytization would be the would be the more accurate term mm-hmm. for what they're doing, but they're they're very aggressive in getting their message out, mm-hmm. and they're very aggressive in training their members on how to deal with Christians. Yeah, um, you know, there's because you know there will be a lot of times where I'll be speaking to somebody and they'll and they'll they'll basically finish my sentence for me, 
mm-hmm. which you know, it can always be very unnerving because it means, oh dear, they've they've heard it before and there's you know it didn't it didn't affect them. Oh dear, what do I do? You know, mm-hmm. um, so it can be very intimidating to to deal with somebody who's a part of another religion and what ends up happening a lot of times is uh they like you just kind of walk away and you just you you don't want to go out again for fear of dealing with that mm-hmm. you know, or worse you start like you walk away feeling like oh there's nothing wrong with that group they're just they're just a little off that's all um mm-hmm. uh, you know and you obviously don't want that because you know then you're you're allowing false teaching to have you know, the same authority as, as the truth, you know, sure. and, and that can be very dangerous for yourself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that's why it helps to, to, as you say, you know, have a knowledge of scripture and know that you know that you, you believe what, what's true um, and what isn't. Um, and I think, you know, I would love to see that, the, the four different approaches to cults um, on your blog, if, if you ever do get something like that on your blog do let me know because i think that would be really really helpful sounds, yeah absolutely sounds great yeah I'm, uh that's actually I'm, I'm putting i'm putting it on my to-do list as we speak yeah. oh that's awesome <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm, what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna make it as a, an ebook you know just so that way like people can can download it uh-huh. and you know it'll be it'll be a free resource of course because mm-hmm. you know i just i want I want people to know how to deal with this. Yeah. Uh, but this has been something that I've been I've been carefully constructing over the past several years, um, you know, just so I can I can get it out there for other people. So, uh, you know, what you will see is you know many many years of uh, of uh, struggling, <laughs> you know, coming coming into fruition for sure, because mm-hmm. it can be frustrating. Absolutely, and that, I mean I think that's going to be a terrific resource for people, especially with someone like yourself who has spent many years in evangelism. It's just um, I think that will be a gem of 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 insight and help for for people. Sounds really really good. Um, and if there's someone listening and they have a loved one in in some kind of a cult or some kind of a group, how would you advise that person who's who's listening today? And that's a that is honestly the hardest one, um, you know, because because you love that person, you don't want to deal with any kind of falling out, you know. So that that there's there's always that fear that that presides over over uh, this sort of situation, uh, you know. Naturally, people are going to want to like protect them, you know, and, and their beliefs because you you don't want them to to hate you, but. You know, Jesus very clearly said, you know, that if anyone does, if anyone doesn't hate their father and mother, they're not worthy of me. It doesn't mean we have to hate them, Mm -hmm. but that's just how important Jesus is to where by comparison, you know, of how much you love that person by comparison, like your love for that person will look like hate compared to how much you love Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so when Jesus worthy of me, if you don't hate them like it's it's very strong so you know it it's a sacrifice that you kind of have to make but you do need to speak the truth to this person um you know if you if you have to you know sit them down you know break it to them gently don't sugarcoat it you know don't don't beat around the bush because i mean you know you love this person so you want them to know the truth um it's it's really tough. I mean, I you know I, I myself have family members who are a part of are a part of uh, different differing cults um, with equal you know levels of of difficulty, and um, you know the the fact of the matter is is that you you are you know we are as Christians to tell the truth and to warn people, mm-hmm. you know, and and once they have been warned, I mean, your conscience is clear. You know, so you tell them the truth. You sit down with them. You tell them the truth. Uh, you know, all of the same things that I've that I've brought up as far as how to deal with somebody on the street. You still apply that same principle to to somebody you love and care about, mm-hmm. because you know if you don't if you if you're not going to do it to somebody you care about, don't be doing it to somebody just on the street. Yeah. You know, I mean that you know just a matter of you know you know treating everybody. You know, like they're human. Um, but yeah, I mean, but the the fact is, is that you know we are required to to tell the truth. You know, tell them the truth, warn them, mm-hmm. and you know, you you put it in their you know in their hands as a you know like you 
you give it to them as their – make it their responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, never stop loving them. Never stop praying for them. Um, you know, shower them with kindness, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, you, you need to give them more kindness than you would a complete and total stranger because at least the stranger you're never going to see again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so if it's somebody in your house, I mean, you know, do nice things for them. Like, yeah, just, you know, do their laundry for them every once in a while, mm-hmm. you know, or just, you know, pick up a treat at the store. You know, show them that you genuinely care about them and that you're not just trying to be right. Yeah. Um, you know, they may still uh, hate you. They may not want to ever talk to you again. I mean, uh, in fact, really, I mean, a lot of these cult groups, I mean, they have very severe consequences for leaving. Mm. I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they don't they don't even want you associating with non-members. Yeah. Um, you know, so even if you're, you know, even if you have like a close brother or sister who you love very much, um, you know, if you like if they're also a Jehovah's Witness and you leave the, the watchtower, you mm-hmm. leave the kingdom hall, they are required to never talk to you again. Yeah. And, you know, and even like with uh, with Mormons, what they'll usually do is like they'll they'll help you get set up in business. You know, so you can become very wealthy. You can get a house and, you know, have a big family and stuff. But if you ever leave, they will tell all of their their mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. to boycott you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not easy. You know, the consequences that they're facing are something that they're very afraid of. Yeah. But you know, you just you just got to remember which is worse. Um, you know, a little bit of tribulation here on earth for, you know, what maybe a couple of months, maybe a couple of years, even many years. Mm-hmm. But, you know, is that really worse than eternity burning in hell? Yeah. You know, so their salvation matters a whole lot more than their comfort. Mm-hmm. So as as hard as it is, you should definitely speak to them about it. You know, don't put it off because, you know, for the same reason you shouldn't put off evangelism, mm-hmm. you know, um, because you don't know how much longer you have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you will regret it if you don't talk to them and anything happens to them or anything happens to you mm-hmm. uh, where you're not able to talk to them. And so, I mean, there have been – you know, there have been, you know, family members who, you know, I've, I've shared the truth with them and, you know, they, they wrote me a letter saying, leave me alone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, don't, you know, don't talk to me about this again. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't get to talk to them ever, but, you know, like basically this, this person in my family just kind of said like, you know, I still love you brother, but stay out of the part of my life, mm-hmm. you know, which it, it hurt me dearly because I, I care about this person, mm. you know, very much, but, you know, I, I shared the truth mm-hmm. and, and, and they, they know now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then sometimes, you know, I've heard of that before and sometimes maybe they'll never ask again, but, but, but sometimes in the future, um, these folks, they will want to ask a question and they'll remember that you were the one that shared the truth with them. So, um, you know, they back to you and ask to open up that, that type of conversation again. So, um, yeah, as you say, it is important to, to tell them. Um, and what would you say, what's the best thing to do for anyone who has left one of these, these groups or, or one of these cults? Well, first of all, dance for joy, <laughs> praising God. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because it's it's beautiful to to hear about uh, people having been set free, because it does happen. You know, nobody nobody is unsavable. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody nobody is uh, beyond uh, you know uh, being liberated. Yeah. So, um, you know, but really, it's it's extremely important to you know make sure that they are they are taken care of. Because, like I said before. Um, you know, depending on how severe of a situation they were in, you know, they might be out of a job. They might be out of a home. You know, they might have lost all of their friends. You know, they might have family members who have completely excommunicated them. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a very dangerous time for them. Mm-hmm. And they're very vulnerable. And some of them may even get death threats. You know, that is yeah. a, real, a real possibility. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially, yeah, with, with certain certain other religions where they will, you know, they will, you know, like they're required even, mm-hmm. you know, like like Islam, if you leave Islam, they're required to kill you, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. So like if they know that you're an apostate from, from their religion, they, they, they'll hunt you down. Yeah. You know, it's really scary. Yeah. So 
um, depending on where they're coming out of, you should do your best to protect them, you know, in their safety. Um, you know, make sure that they are, you know, like that their deficiencies are are ministered to, because you know they need that community, they need that fellowship, mm -hmm. because they're going to feel very alone. Yeah. You know, and if you like, basically, if you if you know of any groups in that local area of like ex members of said cult, you know, get them connected into that because you know there's going to be that that mm -hmm. feeling of yeah, I'm not alone. Absolutely. Uh, you know, but it's definitely very important to to share your life with them and to make sure that they're taken care of because otherwise they're gonna they're gonna come right back into where where they were because it's all they know. Mm -hmm. You know, if it happens to prisoners in a, a literal criminal prison, it's going to happen to the spiritual prison that people are in. Of you know? course, absolutely. I, I agree with that. And um, we're just about at the end of the show. C could you remind listeners of, of your website details and then please pray as you feel led to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Uh, if you want, if you want more information about Set the Captives Free Ministries, uh, the website is www.scfministry.com. And when you visit the website, uh, if you uh, subscribe to the mailing list, you will actually get the um, the Jehovah's Witness ebook that I wrote. You'll get it immediately as soon as you sign up. You'll get it completely for free, and um, you know, along with that, you'll get you know, you'll get uh, all of the resources that I regularly send out. Uh, and if you want it to, if you want to get more information from me personally, uh, you can give me a call toll free at one eight five 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 zero seven zero three seven nine, or you can write to me at Set the Captives Free Ministries, P.O. Box four six seven, Modena, New York, one two five four eight. Uh, and and. Thank you all once again for listening. I'm just going to pray now. Father in heaven, you are truly the, the great liberator. You, you set the captive free. Uh, you are, you are the, the great healer. You are the great uh, physician. Uh, so many things about you are great. Um, I'm so thankful for being here right now. I'm thank you for I'm, I'm thankful for Laura. I'm thankful for everybody who's who's tuning in right now. Uh, pray that you be with all of them, and that uh, that your anointing goes out onto this message. And in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Willie, and we'll need to have you back on the show again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Bye bye. The views expressed in this production may not necessarily be those of Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio. Sounds to energize your faith.